don't want to promise people jobs at the end of the program so they can't develop you to be a particular individual because if you are a particular position then it's like oh okay if that position is available then it's automatically yours so they don't do it's it's sad for us because you spend two to three years without a proper structure of what your role is so it was less than the the gross was less than 35 when i left right what they study and what they're going to do are two totally different things but no my we can't be fifty thousand. Uh-uh. when you are saying you are spending fifty thousand, excluding your flights hi guys welcome to the village my name is bonnie i create content around careers education with a dose of reality check today i have lovely young lady Male Bukosi, who is currently teaching English in a university in China. I want her to give us the tea about mechanical engineering and her experience in the graduate program and how she then moved to do other things and not be in engineering and what are the reasons. We want to know what were the reasons for her to leave engineering. Um, not that she, she left it because she can always go back, but at the moment, she is teaching English in a university in China. Let's welcome Malevo. Hi, Malevo. How are you? Hi, I'm great. And yourself? We are good. Please say hello to the village. Hi. How are you guys doing? And I hope everybody is, uh, you know, doing great. <laughs> okay. Malevo, tell us, um, why did you leave mechanical engineering? Or should we say, I don't think you left. Maybe you took a break. You know, maybe that's how we should uh, phrase the question. Why did you take a break? No. Um, Can you take us through that? Uh, So in terms of engineering, as you mentioned, I haven't left engineering. Uh, That's the first part. Uh, I'd say, I yes, I definitely uh, took a break mostly from corporate than the engineering field uh, because for me, I feel like as an engineer, you don't take a break from engineering. Was engineering, mechanical engineering, your first choice? Like, when did you know that? Yes. This is what I want to do. It was your first choice. When did you know? Uh, Grade six. So I learned about mechanical engineering um, in the automotive Mm -hmm. industry, actually, or like vehicle engineering um, around grade six. I I learned about it from a show called Hip to be Square. So they used to cover quite a number of tech related, um, um, like, you know, concepts. And they went to a... A factory where they manufacture vehicles and they were actually showing different um, robots that were within the, um, the factory and how they manufacture cars. And yeah, from there, I decided that I wanted to become a mechanical engineer because I believed I was smart enough and I did enjoy maths and science. So okay. I, w- I then went to a technical high school. From a technical high school, I went to University of Pretoria. <laughs> uh, which school did you go to? Uh, Bukoni Technical Secondary School. It's based in Attridgeville. Um, just before you, just before you exit Attridgeville or when you enter Attridgeville. So like, how long did your degree take? Yes. Your, your undergrad? I failed, um, a major. So actually it wasn't a major. It was a, a course that uh, it's called a prerequisite. I failed a prerequisite because everything was like a major. We didn't have a lot of electives in uh, the engineering field, right? Okay. So everything was a co- what is called a core module. So if you fail something, it affects other things later on. So because okay. I failed, um, I failed one uh, module in in my first year. It affected my second year so i ended up going from one year to year 1.5 year two year 2.5 so it mm-hmm. became a mess so it, it, it like it extended it by by five years so from four years to five years then in my final year i also failed my design project i think okay did you have a bursary yeah. uh yes with the same in uh company that uh, eventually employed me but then it wasn't because i had a buzzer with them i actually went through like the entire interview process because they dropped me in my fifth year 
and because you know slow academic progress and everything so yeah. um my final my my actual final final year i got um uh, nesfa sponsored but then mm-hmm. it wasn't a it was when it changed from a grant to a bursary how was it to get in the program was it easy for you the process because i'm trying to mm-hmm. give a picture to someone who's a graduate just who's to understand a graduate. was it easy for you yes. how did it work how did you get it i was part of the commercial vehicle bursary program uh but then i actually got in, employed for the um, passenger vehicles um graduate program so because i'm already exposed to the business as a graduate uh, as a uh intern or as a uh bursary student i understood the business from that level cuz what we used to do was every december and january we will go and work right we used to do what is called vacation work so i understood uh, like exactly what the company does really really well i was new to the company and uh, like what they do there we've actually been to that plant before they flew us to that plant as part of the bursary program um so we, i also had like some understanding of like what they do there uh, as much as it wasn't as intricate but then i had some exposure so how was that for you mm-hmm. was it easy or hard Uh I think it was okay. There were times where I didn't feel as challenged and also I didn't feel like it was properly st- uh, structured. So we didn't uh, get a lot of skill transfers from the people that were around there. So like you had to figure your way out around like different things. So it could have been like, you know, better organized in terms of skill transfer but in general i got to learn a lot about the automotive industry i would say i understand the automotive industry holistically um because in the role that i was in i got to interact with a lot of departments uh within uh the production environment and even the internal and external customers but mostly internal customers and so forth so i got to understand the automotive in because i'm a big picture thinker so i'd like to understand the different parts of like the business as much as i'm not a manager or anything okay. it just makes me okay. think a bit better around certain things then i can explain like oh maybe this is why this this is happening this is why we need to do that and all of those things so that's mm-hmm. um that's what i got from it i got exposure to like the entire business in some mm-hmm. sense so due to the position that i was assisting in but in terms of the structure of the program itself yeah it could have been better like some of my friends um with companies where their graduate programs they have like proper skills that are in line with the career fields that they're going to be in and with the one that i was in i think it was a bit wonky so i didn't like that they weren't really clear goals as to uh what you need to be and i think it's because they don't want to promise people jobs at the end of the program do you mind sharing with us how much we're earning you are not there you can share now okay <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> but okay i don't like sharing uh corporate numbers but i'll share ballpark fi- uh, figures so it was less okay. than the the gross was less than 35 when i left right it was less than 35 more than 32 <laughs> so wait. <you> will <laughs> wait hold on as a graduate trainee yes you guys were earning that much as graduates <laughs> as trainees wow that's impressive yes yes i think so you, you get range. twice <laughs> yes, so um yes, the, the range, range is between that's... 32 and 32 and 35 um i think current graduates awesome. might be on 30 36 maybe and it, once you get permanently employed it's like almost twice that amount somewhere there wow. and if you if you're an ftc yeah some people are talking about um so as an ftc fixed term contractor then they don't take the benefits so you get everything with uh, without them taking the benefits so if you get an ftc mm-hmm. position a lot of people were um, gunning for ftc positions because if you get an ftc position you can end up like you know achieving most of your financial goals in a year or two mm-hmm. um so mm-hmm. yeah okay no that would have been nice uh, so now do you remember how many of you were in the program during the time during your time you were there you- for three years right 
Yeah, apparently it was hundred and something because it's a big company. So there's about three thousand mm-hmm. of us. So in total, and then in terms of the graduate programs, it was about plus minus hundred people. Any the- advice you would give mechanical engineering students or graduate? What advice would you give them right now? Uh, someone <laughs> who's like maybe a graduate or they are currently a student, maybe a, a fourth year student. <sighs> what would you say fourth year student? Mm. So. I would have to understand their situation. Are they struggling or they're not struggling? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but uh, they, are they struggling with their cause? Like, are they struggling in terms of their cause uh, or are they like thriving? Because that will determine how they um, do in industry as well. But I think what I'll uh, mention to them is that what they study and what they're going to do are two totally different things, but they must um, see how they can still apply engineering skills because you can always have, you always have the opportunity to apply the skills that you learned as much as the work might not be exactly in line with what you studied, which can be very frustrating because a lot of engineers, when we get into industry, we're frustrated by the fact that we can't really, uh, do the work that we employed for, especially in South Africa, um, because the type of engineering that we do as people that get a four-year degree, it's more about design, right? And research as well. Mm -hmm. So when you get to industry, it's more of a a uh, technology, technologist position so you're just like doing maintenance work there isn't necessarily like a lot of r&d so it frustrates quite a number of engineers so you know my level i'm i'm listening to you you are chatting and i know you, you are saying Guti, they must be aware Guti, they might what they studied might not be actually the real job because mm-hmm. what they do with the job you know because as an as a engineer, you studied design. You said design and um, mm-hmm. you more on the design so, side. Design and research. Yeah, so R&D is basically at the core of uh, what people that um, do the four-year degree do, right? So we're more focused mm-hmm. on um, design and research, whereas there isn't a lot of R&D stuff, R&D work. There are some design mm-hmm. companies, there are a couple of design companies within SA, but you find out that they don't pay as well because they are small companies. But the big mm-hmm. companies are you know companies where uh, the r&d is done elsewhere they done at the mother plant or uh, i forgot exactly Mm -hmm. what it's called but they'll be done at the mother uh, i'll call it a mother plant for lack of a better term right like in germany for example yes they they do they do it in r&d yeah or japan whichever mother plant it um your company belongs to then they will be dealing with that and you as a recipient of uh, designs that other engineers designed, then it can be a bit frustrating, but there's still some engineering work there and there. You can always find Mm -hmm. engineering work. I don't think it's like completely out, but then it's not like the way you might envision it as someone that hasn't been to, to industry. Right. So it's not going to be Mm -hmm. that on a daily basis, you're designing bearings or you're designing bolts, which are things that, we had to do so you kind of like ask yourself mm. like what was all these um stuff that i was doing and there's some people that do that you know um a friend of mine is like you know sometimes designing pumps and all these other things that we had to uh, learn about and turbines mm. and all of that like in like in SA, we don't even manufacture turbines so <laughs> okay we are really raising good points because so am I correct to think someone who went to a Tibet college, someone who's an artisan, they are the people mm-hmm. who, who, st- who, have who jobs. are doing what they study? What they, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. This, this is what I'm getting from this conversation. That You know the artisans, what they do. But when they get to the plant or wherever, they're doing what they studied, you know? So it's it, it's it, it's it's connect- it is connecting mm-hmm. <laughs> the qualification and the actual job is connecting. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. And with engineering, you could also be in non-technical fields. Uh majority of my friends are in consulting. I'd say forty percent of my friends, close friends are in consulting. 
um, mm-hmm. they are also ones that are in risk, like risk analysts, data analysts, cybersecurity as well from engineering mm-hmm. fields. Like it's not like they, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you no. also find, um, yeah, you also find that you can go to any field that you want. They're in banking as well. So yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Would you say, uh, maybe in summary, maybe, um, not that there are no jobs for engineers, as you are saying, but it might not be what you thought it would be. So that's why you find people preaching into other Frustrated. Mm. Yeah. And, and also, also the frustration. Yeah. And also the frustration of like, oh, this is not what I thought it would be, you know. So it can be slightly frustrating from time to time. Um, because you'd like to apply the, the knowledge and the skill that you gained. And like, there isn't, there aren't multiple opportunities to do that. And then you also battle with what must you do when it comes to your, um, um postgraduate degree. Cause you go and study a master's. What are you going to use that master's for? It's just going to end up being like another qualification. Maybe it's best if you do an MBA because you then become a manager. You moved to online space. Right. That's what mm-hmm. that's the route you took. I, I know you've tried yes. a couple of other businesses, but I want us to talk about the online space. That's what found you and it's, it's something rare. People are like, How? You could have done other things, you know. Tell us a bit about mm-hmm. making money online. How did that come about for you? I know already I, I can see from our conversation you were not interested to pursue like you were like, okay, if my program mm-hmm. is done, I, I, I just want to do something else, you know? So how did yes. it come about for you? Okay. So, um, firstly, it started in August, 2021 while I was still working. Um, so mm-hmm. that's when I was pers- uh, pursuing side hustles. So, because okay. I had just started being like a devoted Christian, I was like tithing and I'll be left with 400 bucks at the end of the month, like after mm-hmm. everything. And that mm-hmm. didn't make sense to me to say, okay, how am I left with 400 bucks? Yes, I'm earning this late 20s salary, but you know, the money is not, mm-hmm. um, is, is not adding up. I, and I had recently bought a car as well. So there were a lot of mm-hmm. expenses coming, um, to me from left, right, and center. So I decided, okay, I'm going to get side hustles. So there've been quite a number of side hustles that I will see and just mm-hmm. like, ah, okay, whatever, I'll explore it sometime. So that time I started becoming a bit more intentional. So I started with traditional side hustles like Uber, uh, deliveries and so mm-hmm. forth. So those ones, I realized that I became very, very tired. Like, and they would require for me to work crazy hours. And I felt like I wasn't um you know getting a lot of value from it like let's just say a delivery is 25 rent per delivery so in an hour mm-hmm. you have to do at least four or five deliveries it's it gets mm-hmm. quite tiring and with a car the fuel as well so it's like you still mm-hmm. have to subtract that so when i realized like okay i'm trying to make money there is a bit of money and opportunities in around this thing mm-hmm. but um it doesn't like for me it doesn't make sense and i wasn't a perfect driver so i didn't like that as well <laughs> so okay that form of uh making money was not the best suited then i started searching uh about making money online and i stumbled across a lady called um you know, why am I forgetting her name now? But yeah, the mm-hmm. uh, Queen Magomani, Queen Magomani, I stumbled mm-hmm. across, and then I realized like, oh, she's actually talking about making money uh, online in South Africa. Cause I'll find a lot of mm-hmm. channels that talk about making money online elsewhere and you try that thing and it doesn't work or it's not available. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I noticed also that the market is uh, quite like it's it's not well catered for i'm like okay there are a lot of people Mm -hmm. that obviously want to make money and they want to make money online but there's literally one creator in south africa that's sharing all this information and she was very she still is very reputable majority of the time Mm -hmm. when she's sharing something it's a legit platform she does the research um sometimes Mm -hmm. those things are difficult to implement but i noticed that surveys were easy to implement then because i like sharing information so from the time i started working i was sharing information about 
finances, right? So how do we save? Mm -hmm. How do we invest? How do we do this and that? So it mm -hmm. was like a natural thing for me to start mm -hmm. sharing about how do we then go into side hustles. Um, then my mm -hmm. account blew up on TikTok. And that's when I discovered affiliate marketing. And that's when I would make mm -hmm. like upwards of 5,000 US dollars from affiliate marketing. And then I'm like, yeah, hey, there's money here. Most. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, please like and share this video. And I'll leave um, uh, contact, um, uh, details and um, uh, channels um, uh, on the description box. Okay, you can look out yes. for uh, information there. But uh, you can also just leave uh, my questions for her uh, on this uh, mm -hmm. platform, please. I will answer <laughs> we need those questions. For the algorithm. Yes, yes. We <laughs> gonna come back and answer your questions. So then yeah, you are making money. On average, I know you've done quite a, a lot of, you've done with quite a lot of platforms online, mm -hmm. but which ones mm -hmm. do that for you and how much were you making from those before we get to teaching? Let's just talk about that. So okay. that's, that's teaching something else. Yeah. All right. All right. So I want to be clear with my journey because I don't like, um, you know, hyping mm -hmm. things up. So because okay. there was affiliate marketing, I tend to make a lot more money than the typical person that will make money online due to affiliate okay. marketing. So I want to preface it by that. Right. So mm -hmm. if I'm doing active work, like anyone would do, the platforms that did really well used to be what, uh, what is called mission platforms. Cause those ones will pay you anything between 65 and maybe th uh, up to 800 rent per job. So those were the ones mm -hmm. that I really, really liked. Um, even while I was still working on weekends, I'll go and do uh, missions. And since East London was a small town, uh, you'd find out mm -hmm. that I'm one of the few people that are there. So I could do as many jobs as I wanted and you get like compensated per job, right? So, and mm -hmm. you get compensated well-ish, um, as compared to surveys. Surveys are a drag, but then they also <laughs> help from time to time, right? They are, le okay. they are legit platforms where you can make money through surveys as well. And with surveys, if you're not doing them as hard enough, um, maybe you'll make 200, 300. With missions, if there are missions around, you can make maybe 500 to 1,500, right? Depends on whether or not there are a lot of missions and if there are a lot of workers as well. So if there are a lot of people that grab those missions, then you might not be able to get as much money. But if mm -hmm. you are the only person that's grabbing those jobs, then in a weekend, you could even make 2K. There are people who are in smaller towns that can make like 2K. There's a lady that made 30,000. Um, she was making 10K each month from just missions, right? I remember she said she was unemployed and because I shared these opportunities and she learned about it, she was able to make at least 10K each month for about three months. Okay. So okay. yeah, missions were really, really great before I hopped on to teaching English online. So teaching English online is a bit more stable than missions. As mentioned, missions come of, um, far and few in between so yes you'll grab a mm -hmm. job and then eight months later that's when the platform posts a new job or some platforms they do have frequent jobs but they might not be in your city so there's always like mm -hmm. you know challenges there and there it's not as frequent and you can't really say when a job will be uh, jobs will be available but with teaching english online it's like a standard job you just work from home and you are an independent contractor you work when you are available to work uh, they don't dedicate mm -hmm. they don't uh, dictate how many hours you work and mm -hmm. um actually they give you the minimum the make yeah minimum you could work some companies will tell you okay in a month you need to work at least 40 hours uh, for um not less than 40 hours and some will say not less than 10 hours so those are the mm -hmm. maybe requirements that they could have but then it's not that they dictate when and how you work so you will decide how you achieve those 40 hours and so forth mm -hmm. so if you have marketing, marketing machines and teaching teaching english online right teaching can english online more? yes those are the most profitable ones yeah can you tell us more about uh teaching english online what people need i know mm -hmm. they can still like visit your youtube channel i know you speak more in detail about it but for the sake yes. of we are here now uh what do i need can i teach english online um without a degree 
Yes, you can. Um, but not all the platforms allow people without a degree to teach English online. So each um, platform has its own requirements. So either you can teach mm -hmm. without a degree or they would require a degree. And the minimum qualification, if they require qualification, is a degree. So if you have a diploma, it doesn't count, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you have an advanced diploma, sometimes as well, it doesn't count. As much as in South Africa, an advanced diploma and a degree are equivalent, um, internationally, they're not seen as the same because they want to see the word bachelor's. Okay. So, so now, um, how long were you teaching English online? before moving to China? I think it was six months. Was it six months? Yeah. Yes, it was six months. So I started uh, 23rd of, 24th, because my birthday was on the 23rd of Jan, 24th of Jan. That's when I started. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked up until sometime in August, I think 23rd of August. Um, that mm -hmm. was my last day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how much are you making on average? I know months would not be the same. And maybe when you're starting out, it was not the same, yes. but uh, on average, what would you say? Um, over 8K, and I work three to four days a week. So over 8,000. Mm, okay. Yes. And then you wanted to move to China now. Why? Um, because I would think teaching <laughs> online is more nicer. Tell us about that, because now we are in China. You are teaching in a university, right? Yes, I am. Um, mm. Well, I've always okay. No, since twenty twenty one, so I've always wanted to move uh, to China since twenty twenty one. So I discovered more about the opportunity, and back then China still paid like really, really well. So I noticed that if I wanted to achieve some of my financial goals, um, mm -hmm. my purpose as well. So like in terms of my purpose, I believe that my purpose is. Um, aligned with educating other people right so i'm an educator at heart and mm -hmm. i like sharing and teaching people various things so and i'm passionate about education as well so mm -hmm. i was like okay maybe let me um take this opportunity and see if i want how i want to be in the education space because i don't mm -hmm. think i want to be an educator in south africa but maybe i could learn mm -hmm. a thing or two in china that will allow me to implement some of the things that i learned in china in south africa in some way so mm -hmm. that's that was like the long-term goal long-term vision mm -hmm. and it's mentioned that the um, compensation incentive was also great and I, I just thought of like the financial various financial goals that i have to say okay i will be able to achieve them and another thing is that it's not corporate so, <laughs> so the, by virtue of it not being corporate it, it okay. tends to be slightly better <laughs> than going okay. back to corporate um, and it allows me to still do my other things, content and all those things. So, okay. yeah, that's the reason why mm. I decided China and traveling. So I love traveling. I like exploring uh, different cultures, learning different, uh, learning more about different cultures. And just, uh, I was just tired of being South Af in South Africa, to be honest. Yeah. So you're teaching English in a university, right? Um, how are mm -hmm. the hours? How many hours do you work per day? Um, so plus minus, uh, six, I'd say. So I work plus minus 20 to 25 hours a week. Okay. Can you tell us how much you are getting there? I know most people, they will say, but they are teaching <laughs> in schools. So it's full time for them. It's not part time. I would think yours is more like on a part time basis. So it might be different, but the ones who are teaching in school, they are ranging between 38k to 45k, you know, so. How is it for you? Yeah. Um, so it's above 40 and below 45. So, yeah. That's <laughs> okay, the range. between 40 and 45 for you. Take home. You yeah, have... take home. Take home. Okay. Uh, accommodation? Who's paying for your accommodation? No, I have to pay for the accommodation. So, unfortunately, my offer doesn't um, include accommodation. So, yeah. But how is your rent? Let's talk about uh, um, cost, like standard of living. Cost of living. Standard sorry. of living. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So the cost of living here is 
like this. <laughs> okay. So the reason why I'm saying it's like this is because one thing would cost really, really high and ridiculous, like takeouts. For some other reason, when it comes to takeout, I spend plus minus hundred rents just for one. Whereas in South Africa, mm-hmm. you can get like a big Mac for maybe sixty bucks or seventy bucks, right? So here, mm-hmm. on average, it'll be like plus minus hundred bucks, which is okay. which is a lot of money. But when it comes to clothes, um, the clothes won't be as expensive. Yeah. But then, and other items won't be as expensive. Uh, transport is really, uh, like, really, really cheap. Public transport is really, really cheap. Apart from if you want to use e-hailing, which is like your uh, Uber. Um, your Uber. But here it's, yeah, so e-hailing is, is a bit expensive. Uh, but then, pub, like, buses, which work quite efficiently, always on time and everything, mm-hmm. they, like, for me, I only pay 80 bucks to go to work every, um, for the entire month. How is so, the rent, the rental? Like, where you stay? How is the rent? Oh, the rental is, um, Oh, okay. The rental, the accommodation is for me, I would say that I'm paying on the lower end of uh, how much apartments usually cost in Shanghai. So I'm paying 7,000 rents for fully furnished um, apartment. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of like cheap for the rental amount that you usually pay in Shanghai because Shanghai on average, you pay 4,000 RMBs, which is 10,000. So that's like the okay. average. So it's definitely below average. Uh, but obviously for mm. a lot of South Africans, it's like kind of on the expensive side. Let me talk about the cost of moving. You know, I might be watching this video, okay. but I'm unemployed. My Like there is no money at home, but maybe my mother is thinking or my father, my parents are thinking, Maybe we can get a loan or whatever. What are the costs and how can okay. they prepare themselves mentally? Okay. All right. In terms of the cost, the cost vary uh from person to person right the reason why mm-hmm. it varies from person to person it depends which city you're going to it depends on the rental mm-hmm. amount that you're going to be paying it also depends on the f flight um on the airline that you take when it comes to flights Mm -hmm. because when uh, in china it's common for foreigners to pay a deposit uh one month rent and agent fee so all those amounts you pay them up front right before you move in so that can be anything between uh 30,000 to 45,000 depending on the rental amount obviously um so Mm -hmm. Um, then you'd have to save that amount by yourself or you can get an advance from your school. So some people ask their schools to help out, but you need to make sure you agree with your school from the get-go. You don't want to come the side without having uh, mm-hmm. the amount ready. And then the school is like, uh, but you're the one that's paying for that amount. So they're not going to give you that amount when you get here. Even though accommodation is part of your agreement, house allowance is part of the agreement, you're the one that initially pays that and you'll get it back from the school, right? So you can ask for an advance as mentioned. So they can definitely maybe give you 25,000. Uh, so, yeah, I haven't heard of people uh, getting more than 25,000. So for example, uh-huh. in my program, they did give us an advance of 25,000. Um, so I had saved 50,000 uh, before uh-huh. moving uh, the side. So, and the majority of that amount was spent throughout <laughs> that first month. Okay. So it's the advance okay. I received, which I've paid back everything because I don't like debts. Mm-hmm. So I've paid back okay. uh, that amount and also the flights. So what helped me with the flight? I didn't even use my 50,000 to buy the flights. So I used a credit card that I had, but still that 50,000 I can't really say I saw a lot of it being remaining in the bank in the first month. I just saw so many things going. You know, I don't know. I, I will should actually track what my finances. Things? Okay, so th- I had to buy things in South Africa as well. So like my mm-hmm. traveling bag, I bought a traveling bag which okay. was two k. I bought um, what are they called cosmetics? Uh, that was like you know plus minus five thousand. Not co- just co- mm-hmm. toiletries, cosmetics, everything, plus minus 5,000. Okay. Uh, other little things that I had to purchase, 
um, like you need to buy spices because they don't use the same spices as we do. They have maybe black pepper and salt, but that's as far as mm. you get. You know, everything else okay. that you want spice wise, you need to bring it for yourself, aromat and all those things. So I had to buy like little things while I was um, oh, no. in South Africa. So 10, 10 to 15k went to the little things that I had to purchase um, while in South Africa, not even here. <laughs> So okay. once I get here, I'm left with 35k and I have to pay okay. uh, three months rent plus um, deposit plus um, agent fee, which was about, I think, 38,000 or something like that. But I only received 25,000 from my employer. Yes, so that's again, <laughs> the rent is 7,000. So if we have to pay for three months, yes. that's seven times three. Okay, that's fine. And then yeah. you need to pay the deposit is how much? One month, one month deposit. So okay. you're paying four months so, worth of rent. Basically. Okay. So, so seven which is 28,000 already. 28,000. And then the yeah, agent 28, fee is how much? Mm -hmm. And the agent 3, fee? 3,500. Rents. 3,500. Because it's half, it's, yeah, it's half of the amount that you pay in a month. So uh, okay. the rental amount, so it's about three thousand five hundred. So then you, okay. um, actually, like um, it, this is an underestimate because I use two point five, but the current um exchange rate is two point six. So it's just slight, it's slightly above yeah. that, like seven point yeah. three, seven point four. It becomes about thirty two thousand. Like it was about thirty, yeah, thirty two, thirty two thousand that I had to pay in the first month. So mm -hmm. then, as I mentioned, okay. the school gave me 25,000. Um, so mm -hmm. then I could uh, pay that amount. And then what else? So they reimburse us the flights. So we, in the first month, you get uh, flight reimbursement. But then it's not how much you paid for the flight. They just give you 25,000 for the flights, even if you paid 15,000, because I paid 15,000. Like I decided to sign a six months lease. Oh, although my contract is a year long. The reason behind that, I wasn't sure I wanted to stay here for the entire period. So in the case I find something better, then I'm not like, you know, I have commitment issues. Okay. okay. From what I'm, I'm gathering here, it looks like you need 100,000 to move. Not really. How much? I think 50,000, around 50,000 should be fine. Fifty to sixty thousand. No, Malay, we can't be fifty thousand. Uh -uh. When you are saying you are spending fifty thousand, excluding your flights. Okay, yeah, maybe seven. Let's say seventy. Yeah, so seventy is the thing. Is that it's about um, how mentally prepared are you to deal with the harsh reality of? the fact that you might have to compromise on certain things. In the first month, a lot of people probably go on diets that they didn't intentionally <laughs> okay. have to go on because it's like, you know, you realize like I, life is going to be quite expensive if I have certain things. So you like for, Oh, I'm going to share my little things that I had to do for the mm. first, um, for the first week. Was it the first week? I literally didn't have any bedding. For the first week, I didn't have bedding. Okay. I would like sleep with like a towel and stuff like that. But because I was still getting my stuff sorted, I couldn't buy online and I didn't want to buy the things that I saw in this other shop. Because some shops, they, some items are hard to find physically because in China, mm -hmm. we have a lot of online stores. So mm -hmm. I wasn't sure about the price range because um, when, uh, when it comes to the... Uh, and I still need to get that uh, reimbursed. So when it comes to the ride from the airport to here, I paid 500 RMBs, which is 1,300. So I paid 1,300 mm -hmm. for one ride, which is an hour long. And even in South Africa, yeah. you can't pay that. So obviously, mm. since I'm not a local, sometimes I can see price tags, but they can also overcharge me on certain things because I just don't know how uh, things are priced. But online, I can see, oh, okay, there's this amount, there's that amount. This, so this is the, the um, common amount. So that's why I wanted to wait a bit longer. Not that I didn't have money to purchase stuff or okay. the wind stuff, but I decided that, okay, since there's an aircon, 
I'm going to, you know, wait a bit up until I can uh, get like to the online part of the stores mm. till I buy my bedding. So th- those are some I of think- the sacrifices and adjustments that you're going to have to make. So you have to mentally prepare yourself that it's not going to be a home from day one. You're going to be in this foreign land experiencing quite a lot of different things and a lot of challenges some uh you decide to have those because i could have just bought bedding you know and i decided like "Mm -mm, let me do it this way i think seventy thousand guys i mean that's what i'm telling you (laughs) seventy thousand is what you need and then until you get paid it was great having you around thank you Uh, last words please last words uh i know we have to go now um Last words, um, guys, Mina, I'm saying 50 to 70. My label is saying something <laughs> else, but we are sticking to 50 to 70,000 for you to prepare to go to China. Yeah, okay. No, um, I'd say involve God, involve God in all of it, and mm-hmm. everything will run as smoothly as possible. There are things that I can't share on camera, but there's one incident mm-hmm. that maybe I can share off camera with you, which for me okay. uh, played quite a huge role in this whole thing. Um, because, yeah, the, so gener- people's generosity and humanity like it comes through during this period because hey there are a lot of things Mm -hmm. not just financially like adjusting Mm -hmm. to a different environment is quite challenging Mm -hmm. language barrier is a reality becomes a new form of reality i remember going to a kfc and not being able to buy you know like that was my first day that was my first harsh reality like oh you're in a different environment you're in a uh, environment where you can speak the local language and they Mm -hmm. even when they're trying to help you they can't help you because there's just a lot of difficulties Mm -hmm. in communicating you know uh but right Mm -hmm. now um today i told this other guy who wanted to go in front of him like as much as I was just signaled, I was like, the back, you're going to the back. I'm in the queue, <laughs> you know? So it was mm. like, you get a bit comfortable and confident in your space. But initially it, it's like, you know, quite challenging, but it's worth mm. it if you want it. It's worth it if you want if it. You want I want to also, yeah, if you want it, because it, it comes with the challenges are part and parcel of it. Cause you can't mm. just want the other reap the benefits of whatever else it has to offer and not understand the challenges. You have to understand the challenges as well and know that they are part and parcel of the journey. You can talk forever. (laughs) Yes, thank you very much for having me. Okay, guys, we've come to the end of this video. Please like and share with someone that might need it. And let me know uh, what other professionals you would like me to host in this village. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.